Stay tuned for a breakdown of the great Neil Peart's playing on the song Free Will by Rush. Welcome. On this video, we're going to take a look at the great Neil Peart and his playing on the song called Free Will. Before we get into it, make sure to click the red subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you're aware of every time I upload a new video. Now, usually at this time in the video, I do a little bio on the drummer in question, but Neil Peart is so famous that I don't think it's really necessary. If you want some background on him, I suggest you check out the movie Beyond the Light of Stage, which is a biopic on the band Rush, or read his book called Ghost Rider. Pretty neat book and gives you a lot of insight as to his thinking and, you know, sort of how he ticks. Um, so instead, I'm going to launch into a breakdown of the 1980 permanent ways version of the song Free Will. And I'm going to take a look at the main grooves in there and some of the really cool and notable fills that he plays. Make sure to download the material that I have on this so you can follow along and also you can learn the song itself. It's definitely challenging. It's as challenging as it sounds. <laughs> So, let's get into it. The first groove I'm going to take a look at is the introductory groove. And it consists of several time signatures, which is pretty common in this piece. An amazing thing about Rush's music is that it can contain several time signatures in a section, but the section still feels like it's in 4-4. Fascinating. I'm not sure if it's uh, Geddy Lee and Alex Lifeson's Eastern European uh, lineage or what, but they seem to lilt through the time signatures effortlessly and very musically. Neil Peart's approach to this, of course, is outlining the riff that occurs in that part of the music. And um, he, too, glides through the time signatures quite effortlessly. So what I'll do to demonstrate this, because the group itself isn't that tough, is count out loud so you can sort of see how things move. All right, here we go. Right? Pretty interesting. Uh, when I count it out loud, yeah, you can hear when beats are missing, let's say, or added. But uh, if I hadn't told you that and you just sat back and listened to it, well, the piece of music just seems to flow, right? Pretty fascinating. The next groove is the first verse groove, which then goes into the reintroduction of the introduction. <laughs> okay? So, same sort of thing happens. It's kind of weaving through time signatures, and uh, it, it kind of seems to go unnoticed because it feels so good. All right, here we go. One, two, three, uh. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, one. Pretty interesting. Uh, another interesting uh, element of this groove is that Neil Peart pulls out. Uh, you know, quick uh, bass drum notes, in this case, uh, 16th notes at this tempo is kind of fast, right? That kind of speed is interesting in that, you know, uh, for those who are sort of not quite aware of how people implement double bass drums, you might think that he was using two bass drums, but no, that's just one foot. And um, I'm not sure if people uh, in general recognize the fact that Neil Peart has a really, really great right foot. Every much as speedy as John Bonham in the rock world. Uh, John Bonham is renowned for having a very fast right foot, and Neil Peart also does. Here's a great example of that. It does seem to go unnoticed, possibly because there's so many other things <laughs> that are happening in his playing that are uh, uh, very articulate and uh, embellishment-oriented, let's put it that way. Okay, I will give you a few exercises near the end of this portion of the video 
that'll help you develop that foot. Okay, so the next section that he goes into is a half time feel. In fact, I wrote it in four two time because it has sort of a, a four four like backbeat feel, but it's a half time. So it was easier to read in four two, at least for me. I'm not sure if that's how people transcribe it. Uh, I hope you find it easier to read in four two and uh, like less black, put it that way, less notes. And um, also, it, it has this really cool, dare I say, almost R&B type feel to it. You know, like it all sounds like there's 16th notes happening on the hi-hat, although in 4-2, half, in they're written as eighth notes. Uh, the thing about this too is at the end of the phrases, uh, uh, he plays these fills, I guess you'd call them fills, that line up perfectly with what Getty Lee is playing. So you get that great uh, rhythm section ensemble playing energy happening that uh, Rush is famous for. All right, so I'm gonna play this one through uh, at normal speed and also slower as well, but it's in four, so I'm not gonna count out loud. Again, those, those ensemble shots at the end with bass and drums really stand out. Another thing to take note of, as, uh, that I noticed as I was playing along, uh, that he plays the hi-hat kind of straight. Like, instead of playing... It's more like... You know? It's a very subtle difference. But the second approach, I guess, has more of a rock feel. The former, a little bit more of an R&B type feel. But I did notice that, that and the same thing goes for the ride cymbal too, right? It's That's an important distinction in the music. Okay, uh, and here it is, slower. So I wanted us to make sure you got a picture of that slow so you can see how the ends of those phrases sound. Um, and yeah, have a clear picture of that. And of course he sort of plays that way every time that he plays that section. The next section is what I consider the chorus, or it sounds more like a pre-chorus into a chorus statement at the end, free will. But uh, the whole thing is basically a chorus. And again, we're back to changing time signatures. Um, and I will count out loud while I play it. Okay, so here we go. Yeah, so once again, we're skipping through the time signatures in that one. But when you're playing it, you don't, you don't necessarily 
think about it that much, only because the music flows so naturally. But I always keep a third eye with the numbers kind of clicking away in the background, because you never know. If you lose track of things, it goes haywire. Plus, you got to understand, when you get to know the piece of music, like, you know it. So that's that, right? You don't have to worry so much about what's coming as if you were just learning or sight reading. So the next set of grooves are in 6-8 during the very excitable guitar solo. <laughs> that's when the band kind of launches into a kind of, uh, well, a jam session, quite frankly. It sounds like they're jamming, and I think that was their intent, to give it that jam feel. Uh, in 6 and um, they're flying along. The groove is no joke. So here's the first one on the hi-hat. Notice how he has to incorporate the open close hi-hat with this, along with a certain spot on the bass drum when it's doubled up. It's pretty interesting. Okay. And slow. That is definitely very speedy. Um, you really feel it on your right hand. And there's an exercise that I like to do that helps to sync up the right hand and the right foot, which happens on those two sixteenth notes on um, beat three in the six eight bar, up on the right cymbal, and also on the hi hat. On the hi hat, you have that open close hi hat sound on the second sixteenth, like I mentioned. Uh, the next groove is up on the right cymbal, in the middle of the melee, <laughs> when things are really roaring. Incidentally, this, this ride cymbal pattern is something that you often hear in Neil Peart's playing, Peart's playing, I always mess up his pronunciation, excuse me, everybody. all the Neil Peart fans out there. But you always hear this ride cymbal uh, pattern, he likes to do this quite a bit uh, when things are roaring. So here's the same kind of groove, but up on the ride cymbal. Flying. Here it is slow. One, two, three, ah. Uh. All right, so yeah, those are basically the two approaches he takes to grooving in the 6-8. Very frenetic, very intense, uh, sounds great, and always a crowd pleaser if you've ever seen live footage or seen them live, which I have done several times. The next section is, uh, I wanted to dedicate this section to like all the really cool fills in the piece, you know? And uh, most of them are cool, quite frankly, and there aren't that many of them, actually. This is really like a groove tune. Even though it's weaving through time signature changes, it still has a real song feel to it, and it really grooves, you know? So the fills he plays are well-chosen, well-placed, as usual. He generally plays them the same way on his live gigs, generally, not completely. But uh, they're interesting. So here's a, a few of them. Here's the first one that I noticed that Kind of sounds almost like a Gene Krupa like thing on the toms. Okay, here we go. And slow. Yeah. 
really digs in there. And again, it, it reminds me of, uh, yeah, something you'd hear old school big band drummers play, like Buddy Rich or Gene Krupa, something like that, right? All right, the next few uh, notable fills that I found are in 6-8. And uh, this one, this particular one, like, it's like, man, dude's on fire. <laughs> it's kind of killing. Okay. Such a cool feel. Here it is slow. Pretty great. All right, so the next one, again in the middle of the melee. <laughs> and this one, uh, he kind of outlines the, uh, the three, four, the underlying three, four in the six, eight in this one. The bass drum plays on every other um, eighth note in six, eight across the fill. And he distributes it, he sort of orchestrates between the the uh, Chinese symbol and, and the ride. It sounds really good. He does a little different live, I noticed. He, he uh, hits the, the Chinese symbol first live. I had to listen to it a few times on the record to see if he was doing the same thing. And I, I think I got it right, judging by what I hear. But uh, you guys can comment below if you think I'm wrong. I'm not afraid. <laughs> okay. All right, so here is um, the next fill. That one was always really mysterious to me. You know, it was like, what's going on? But once you break it down, you can see that he's really just outlining the three, four, which is the underlying time signature of six, eight, right? Okay, so here it is slow. I'm gonna count out loud so you can really see what's going on. Okay, uh, uh, the next one is, um, is similar to that, but it's sort of leaving that section so very slightly uh, into a 7-8 uh, bar. So here it goes. And slow. All right, definitely a cool fill. Like I said, very much like the first one that uh, was very similar to that uh, on the uh, last example I did. Okay, so we're back in cut time, which is the last verse, a soaring verse, if you will, Getty singing way up in the stratosphere and the heavens are opening up. <laughs> so. Uh, Neil plays this really, really, really big fill before going into the, the actual singing. It's pretty cool. It goes like this. And slow. Okay, and uh, another fill that's in that section, once again, you're able to hear how uh, Neil Peart and Getty Lee really play together here. Like they really are playing pretty much the same thing. Uh, it sound, always sounds great. It's like ensemble uh, in the rhythm section, ensemble section in the rhythm section. 
Okay. Here's that how this one goes. Flow. And the very last one, uh, or the last uh, uh, fill of note that I thought of that was pretty cool is uh, this one. Uh, and it's just a cool little fill that uh, he plays in 7-4. Okay. Well, 4-4, four, four, then 7-4. All very, very cool fills. Uh, well, this one's slow. Hold on a second. One, two, three, four. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, as promised, I'm going to play. Uh, two exercises that really help with, uh, first of all, syncing up the right hand and the right foot, uh, like in that uh, solo section in 6-8. And then um, the next one helps with uh, speeding up your bass drum pedal. So here's the first one. It's very simple. And now twice as fast. That was a really cool exercise from me. I learned it from the great Tommy Campbell. And it's one of those exercises. I mean, you do that for, you know, like five straight minutes or something. And um, like I said, it was really a great exercise in that it, it gave you a sense of balance because you, you have to keep the hi-hat going. So a sense of balance. And it also got your right hand and right foot to cooperate, to work together. And you develop your double strokes on your bass drum at the same time. It's kind of like practicing a samba. Very, very similar to that. Uh, here's a, another uh, exercise that does pretty much the same thing in terms of bounce because the hi-hat's playing and uh, you're working on playing your kick drum evenly and fast. It's harder than it seems. <laughs> Reverse it. And incidentally, as far as the bass drum is concerned, I played each of those a little differently. I played the the one you just heard, uh, heel toe. So, right? That's an exaggeration of it. And the other one I played um, uh, heel up, sort of. <laughs> yeah, you know, both are viable. If, uh, if one feels more comfortable than the other, use that one. 
by any means necessary. Well, I hope you enjoyed this breakdown of uh, the fabulous playing of Neil Peart in the song Free Will by Rush. Uh, I gotta tell you, it's a challenge to play, <laughs> not easy. And imagine, he has a whole set of music like that, uh, the kind of parts he made up. A real loss to uh, the drumming world when he passed away. But, uh, you know, here's his legacy. We can all dig into what uh, magic he created on the drum set all of those years past. So, if you like this video, please like it and share it. Go to albedrumlessons.com for more drumming info and to check out uh, my Zoom lessons. You can get in touch with me to schedule Zoom lessons with me. And now that we're in Omicron, oh my gosh, this pandemic won't end. <laughs> now that we're in Omicron, uh, you know, people are kind of shutting in a little bit more. Maybe not as much as before, but I'm doing more Zoom lessons. So yeah, reach out and get in touch, all right? You can also get me on Instagram. All right, so until next time. Thanks for watching my video. I'm really glad you did that. Subscribe and click here if you want more performance and lesson videos.